Today we are going to talk about deception. And we're going to talk about deception in the in the context of cybersecurity, obviously, because we are at a security conference. And to get it right out of the way, I want to lay out why in the world you should care about deception. And uh, I am not going to be talking about honeypots. There's a lot of crap out there about honeypots. We're going to be talking more about deception as a uh, as a strategy, at a, as a strategy, as a concept or a technique of resiliency, resiliency engineering. And so, uh, in a lot of cases, deception is very much has its roots in offensive, uh, offensive maneuvers, offensive techniques, tactics, procedures, and. Anyone, uh, anyone who is familiar with deception techniques is probably familiar with the art of war, good old Sun Tzu, um, where he says, all warfare in some form or fashion is based on deception. And if you read through this little uh, snippet from the art of war, I'm going to try not to knock my head on these lights as I pace around. Um, if you read through the snippet, you'll see it's very much focused on attacks. It's about feigning weakness. It's about using misdirection in some cases. It's about making the enemy believe something uh, that is not actually true, uh, confusing them regarding state. So historically, deception is very much heavily focused on offensive maneuvers. And I don't actually believe that that has to be the case. There's a lot of things that if you study deception, study uh, the way that Western military political um, technology powers or organizations utilize deception and Eastern, uh, same, same sorts of organizations utilize deception. There's a lot of things that we can take and apply in a defensive context. And so I hit on this really quickly in the, in the beginning on around why you should care, but why would we want to deceive? We deceive to, to gain the advantage back in our, in our favor in some form or fashion. We deceive to, to build more resilient infrastructures, to build more resilient environments. Uh, we don't just deceive to block and you know, find IP addresses to use the band hammer on. Um, at least we shouldn't be. And so I think it falls into two main buckets as to why, as a defender, we would want to deceive. We either want to learn something about the environment that we've been trusted to defend, or we want to instigate and control uh, some sort of, we want to affect change over that environment that we have been trusted to defend. And so these are a few things, again, I'm not going to just read through bullet points. I'm not a fan of, uh, I'm not a fan of that approach. And all of these slides will be available. So you'll have all of that stuff as reference points, um, should you care to read through it. But uh, we want to learn about who's interacting with our environment, how they're interacting with our environment, and how those things change over time. An adversary is, go they're going to, uh, there's a lot of different pressures and things happening as they're working their way through an environment towards some set of assets uh, that they're trying to uh, extract from you or just extract from the organizations that they're targeting. And so deception is a mechanism that we can use to learn about how their tactics change as they're moving. And then from an instigate and control change perspective, uh, we can disrupt, delay, uh, we, can, we can screw with the OODA loops that they're, um, that they're working their way through, and we can force them to misappropriate the resources that they have uh, available to them. And, and I believe that if we think about deception from a strategic capacity, learning can influence change, change can influence learning, and it can be a nice little loop that we ourselves operate through and step through uh, to really swing the advantage back in our in our favor. So, I didn't actually introduce myself. Uh, really quickly, my name is Robert Wood. Uh, I work at a company called SourceClear. I'm the chief security officer there. We don't do anything regarding deception technology. Uh, this is not a vendor pitch in any way, shape, or form. I am uh, Washington, D.C. based, and for a long, long time, I have been a huge dork when it comes to military affairs, politics, uh, intelligent, the world of intelligence. I love reading about deception stuff and hearing deception vendor pitches drives me up the wall. And so this talk was kind of born out of that frustration and that passion of mine. And so this is basically like an organized and prezified brain dump, if you will. Uh, I do have a background in red teaming. So, uh, you know, trying to think outside the box and go all matrix. There is no spoon on a, on a system. And, uh, and that, is, that is me in a nutshell. And I'm a huge Batman fan. So 
Um, really quickly, and this is going to kind of set the tone for uh, how we should think about deception or the various techniques that, uh, that we'll talk about through this talk. Is anyone here familiar with Mark Metesky? Show of hands. Not one person. All right. So Mark Metesky, is anyone familiar with the Red Team Journal? Anyone read it? Anything? All right. So a few people. The Red Team Journal, fantastic online resource, basically walks through all of these more strategic, um, higher level concepts as it pertains to red teaming. And he put out some research a while ago that described three different states of deception uh, in any form of conflict. The first is when two opponents or n number of opponents are going head to head and there is no deception. They're playing above board. Uh, the second is the con, where one side is actively trying to deceive the other. Um, that might be, uh, you know, sending spoofed emails. That might be um, using some form, some form of misdirection. Whatever it is, the, the target of the deception doesn't actually know that deception is afoot. And then to get a little bit more meta, uh, the hypercon... In his, uh, in his language and taxonomy, is when the target of the deception knows deception is at play, but the deceiver does not know that the target knows, you know? And so you can, you can follow this and be a little bit more meta until, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could go a little bit deeper and, uh, and continue this train, but for our purposes, these three states will, uh, will suffice. So keep these in the back of your head and, we'll, and I'll reference them throughout the talk. So deception techniques today. We have things like honey pots. We are starting to do honey, honey things. Uh, we're creating more honey, uh, honey stuff throughout our organization. So honey tokens and uh, honey passwords and honey accounts and stuff like that. Um, we're starting to, uh, we have moving target deployments. Uh, so HashiCorp has their, uh, their Nomad framework. Uh, there's some other tools out there that let you uh, take a single deployment, uh, set of deployment or system deployment uh, infrastructure and then deploy it to different uh, bits of infrastructure on a, on a randomized cadence or on a predictable cadence. Uh, and then there's sandboxing, which is uh, kind of the, the, the bee's knees in terms of deception technologies today uh, on the market. And so that is where if you hit one of these uh, honey tripwires, they will send you into some, uh, some black hole and then just watch what you do and give you some uh, some weird looking web page to interact with and then they'll they'll extract a bunch of TTPs from it and then they will give you their IP address or some sort of uh, mechanism to identify and fingerprint that attacker and then they will let you take the ban hammer and boot them out of your environment. So based on the the way that these sort of technologies are presented to adversaries, um, Having done red teaming and come across some of these things, this falls very much into the hypercon, uh, the hypercon bucket, where we are trying to actively deceive our target. The the adversary in this case knows that deception is afoot, but we are completely blinded to it because we've signed a check and we've implemented something and we've we've got sunken cost fallacy going on and we're we're confident in the sense that. Uh, you know, we've implemented this thing and it is, it is elevating our resiliency to these adversaries. Um, and I don't think that's good enough. So we want to get out of the hypercon state unless we are intentionally, intentionally uh, going there. Um, and actually, we'd probably want to uh, go the next meta level down where they think we know, but we, uh, you know, they think we don't know, but we really know. And so I think the set, the, Deception from the defensive perspective struggles in many cases because so frequently we are operating in that hypercon state where we are presenting very, um, very elementary kind of interfaces to these adversaries. Like if you look at some of the uh, some of these sandboxing tools that are on the market, you're interfacing with a web page, you hit some URL, and then you go somewhere else. You're automatically redirected somewhere else that doesn't even look like the web page that you were just on, and it has some like set of standard basic functionality that you can kind of click through and uh, you know, it'll kind of capture all your network traffic, that kind of stuff. And it's, it's fairly obvious that you've, that you've walked over some tripwire. Or if anyone's ever uh, interacted with a honeypot where you, you, you're doing a port scan and you stumble across those systems that have like you know, thousands of ports open, and it's like, well, that, you know, that, this company is either doing things really uh, freewheeling or that's probably a honeypot. Um, and 
and we have confidence in these honeypots that we're putting out or these honey X things that we're putting out. And so, uh, so I believe most of this or my working theory is that most of the deception technologies on the market today or just in general today struggle because we're falling unintentionally into that hypercon state. So uh, moving on, um, I'm sure folks here are familiar with the kill chain uh, framework. And this is one of the one of the two ways that I want to um, kind of encourage folks to think through think through this problem and how we how we instrument and apply strategically apply deception in our environments. And so adversaries, when they are attempting to get something out of, you know, extract some value out of our organizations, they will work through a basic uh, process that, that flows like this. It is not necessarily linear in this way. They will, you know, they might do a little bit of recon, get to the weaponization, find, they, you know, find something else. They'll go back to recon, do some more, and then, uh, and then continue on. So it's, it is not just a linear thing. Um, it is more of a, uh, a constant cycle. And then within that, we have these things called OODA loops, um, not to be confused with like udon noodles. An OODA loop, uh, for anyone who is uh, not familiar with the term, it is an acronym that was developed by this Air Force pilot named John Boyd back in the day. And it stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And the theory behind it was, as an Air Force pilot, if I can survey the environment that I'm in, uh, assess the, the data that I've just collected, make a decision, and then act on that decision, rinse and repeat. Once I act, the state has changed and there's gonna be new inf info to collect. And so the faster that anyone can cycle through that OODA loop, they will be successful. And you know, the Air Force did a lot of testing in this and uh, from a pilot perspective and found that to be pretty consistently true. And, uh, and I believe that just in general, if for, for somebody who is actively experimenting, they're going through a very similar process, even if they don't sit down and you know, sit in their computer chair and say like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm at this stage of my OODA loop and I need to go here, here, and here, and here. Um, they're going through a process where they're, they're surveying the environment, they're gathering in uh, data, they're uh, creating insight or intelligence out of that, they're making decisions, they're acting on those decisions, and they're cycling, they're iterating, uh, very much like we might do if we're trying to take a product to market or something like that. So, uh, the more uh, that we take these traditionally held responses uh, to the insight that we're getting out of deception technologies, such as blocking somebody, uh, such as banning them, such as uh, doing the trap and trace sort of things, when we are applying or instrumenting technologies that fall into that hypercon state, uh, I believe we are doing that. The more, the more we do that, we are allowing an adversary to fail. And the more that we allow our adversaries to fail, the more that they can learn because every single time they go through that OODA loop, they're learning something new. The state has changed. And in cybersecurity, uh, unlike traditional symmetric warfare, uh, cybersecurity is fascinating because there's almost no consequences. If somebody comes after your organization and they get blocked, they can just boot up a new VM, uh, you know, cycle through some, to some new Tor node and go at it again. They, if they want to come after your organization, there's really no consequences uh, stopping them from doing that. There's not a lot of political uh, kinetic response that you know, governments can take. They're trying to sort all this stuff out, but you know, Congress is trying to keep the lights on, and so we're a ways off from being able to, uh, to deal with things like this. So, say lovey. Um, so the more an adversary can fail, the more that they can learn. And the more that they can learn, the more dangerous that they get every single time that they learn. And so if an adversary is continuously going through an environment, continuously running up against a wall, um, you know, in, in some sort of predictable way, then they're gonna, they're gonna eventually figure out, even if they hit your honeypot uh, a few different times, they're gonna eventually figure out that it is a honeypot. It's not going in a different place. Uh, the tripwire isn't necessarily changing. And so now they, they know that that's a honeypot and now they can go do something else. Um, or they could potentially just smoke screen you and then go do something else. And you could imagine this in, a, in an age of uh, machine learning backed technology where um, you know, the more cycles that you can go through, consider the, uh, the model AlphaGo that trained itself through a number of computer simulations to beat some of the world champions in Go. Same thing happened with, uh, I think it was AlphaZero, uh, Google's chess playing AI. 
uh, the more simulations that it went through and the more times that it figure out how to get its butt whooped in the games of chess or go, the better that it got over time. And so, uh, you know, I have a working hypothesis that this is going to get worse and worse and worse if we continue to apply deception in this in these predictable hypercon state ways. And so I'm going to go on a mild, quick rant on failure, because I think failure is something that uh, it's kind of a heavy word, like, you know, nobody likes to fail. Um, it, is, it scares some people. And especially in our industry, I think, uh, I think we have a very unhealthy relationship with failure. Um, you know, so I'm currently a chief security officer. There's a saying about chief security officers that they are hired to be fired. Um, so, you know, it, I might be asking some of you in a, in a couple of years for a new job. Um, I hope not, but, uh, or if you're, if you're hiring uh, for, or anything, but as, a, as an industry, and I think application security as a subset of the overall security industry is actually paving the way and trying to set a new tone about culture uh, around failure, which I think is really, really inspiring. And I, and I love it, like this whole DevSecOps, um, DevOps integration, just AppSec in general. Um, you know, we are more focused on empowerment and, uh, and learning from failure and blameless postmortems, things like that, than we are uh, blaming everyone. But it started off, we were still very much blaming developers for introducing SQL injections and, you know, not updating their libraries and things like that. And so, so I pulled up a couple completely non-security related industries or companies, whatever, uh, entities that have both a healthy relationship and a not so healthy relationship with failure. And, and I want to talk about why that is really, really quickly. So um, the airline industry, for example, they have two black boxes on every flight. When things hit the fan in, on any flight, uh, so for instance, when I landed here in LAX, uh, our back flap was not opening properly, and we had to pull off um, when we were trying to land three different times, and then they're eventually like, we think we can just slow down, and it's going to be a little fast on the, t on the way down, but like, you know, trust us, uh, it's going to be cool. And, you know, we had people like, you know, rocking themselves and, you know, praying to the Holy Ghost and everything like as we were landing. And it was, uh, you know, it was a little, it was a little fast and intense, but like we made it. Um, I'm here. So, um, but in general, like I, I have every bit of confidence that the airline industry, that Southwest in this case, uh, to their good credit and the airline industry's good credit, they will analyze why that failure occurred as small as it was, even though it did not end up being a disaster. And they will learn from it. The airline industry has a, uh, an incredible reputation for constantly adapting their policies, not just within, you know, if American has a bad screw up, they don't keep that learning within American. They, they shard it out to the entire industry. So the entire industry can grow and learn from everyone else's mistakes and they get better and more resilient as a result. Um, Dyson vacuums. Well, that seems odd. We're talking about vacuum cleaners at a security conference. Um, they, the, the founder behind Dyson, was not the first guy to create a vacuum cleaner uh, that was built on cyclone technology to filter out dust particles, ironically enough. Um, he, however, created over 5,000 different prototypes to try to test out cyclone-based um, dust filtering technologies and eventually emerged with uh, what he thought was a winner and then went to market. Um, he is a huge advocate and he, he actually ended up starting, um, uh, starting this, this whole, I think it's a non like an officially a nonprofit uh, geared around helping people learn how to positively embrace failure in the creative process. Organizations or entities that do not have a great um, relationship with failure. So the healthcare industry, for example, there's a ton of things getting swept under the rug. Um, you know, if somebody, uh, if a patient sadly passes away on an operating table, you know, everyone wants to put the blame on somebody and nobody wants to, to own up and talk about it openly. There is no such thing as a blameless postmortem in the healthcare industry. And so it leads to a lot of silence. Nobody wants to step up. And you could say the same thing about a lot of politics and government uh, entities, but we're not gonna get political here. Um, <laughs> uh, so I personally feel like, uh, and I mentioned AppSec as being, I think, somewhat different in a lot of respects, but I think in many ways, the cybersecurity industry has a not so healthy relationship with failure. And so we are very much all about blaming the users. You know, we're very quick to, 
uh, hang a breach on the CISO's head and get him out the door. You know, you'll see Twitter erupt anytime that something happens. You know, users are stupid. They need to go. Blah 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 blah. And it's and it's really bad. And we we kind of push people away. And I don't think that we uh, do ourselves any favors in learning uh, whenever something goes wrong. Alternatively, the bad guys I think fall into this much more healthy relationship with failure because they are very much object, they're, they're motivated by achieving some objective. And if they don't get it, they come right back. They come right back. They come right back and they get better and faster and stronger and smarter. And they will keep on cycling until they get what they want. And then they'll keep on cycling and they'll, they'll squeeze us for a little bit more. And so they know how to iterate. Um, maybe not all of them, but in general, I think bad guys or gals, uh, bad entities, adversaries, have a much more healthy relationship with failure and learning from failure than do the cybersecurity industry as a whole. So uh, that is my, my quick rant about, about failure. Circling back to, uh, to our uh, kill chain overlaid with the udon noodles, um, we have on here, if we want to start thinking about where we can apply deception technologies, considering how adversaries step through and learn from failure, I think it makes sense. One way that you could, you could look at this problem, if you are considering adopting deception in your environment, is to try to find ways to strategically place it um, within your organization to serve a specific goal. Um, and you can, you can run tests with these sorts of things. It doesn't always have to be, um, it doesn't always have to be in the same places. Uh, but maybe you throw off reconnaissance by pushing out some misinformation. Uh, maybe you throw off um, throw off C2 by having uh, like proxies in place that can uh, that can delay things, that can monitor things. That you know, there's a there's a number of different things that you could do, and I'll touch on those just a little bit later. I have like a little toolbox of sorts um, of just one-liners that you could uh, that you can take and try out. But think about what you're trying to actually achieve with deception and then experiment with it. So with that, uh, I think as a, as a whole, when we're thinking about deception as a capability, we need to have some kind of strategic plan backing that capability. Um, you, you, know, you wouldn't come into an organization and say, we need application security. And so we're going to take the off the shelf AppSec capability, and we're going to drop it into this organization. You know, you wouldn't do that with incident response. You wouldn't do it with monitoring and alerting. There are things that you can learn from and apply in your unique context of an organization, but you wouldn't just drop the cookie cutter thing on your org and expect it to be successful. So does anyone have any idea what this is a picture of? Because I think this is a very fascinating example of why strategic priorities and planning uh, matters in deception. What's up? Uh, no, that is uh, that is not it. Any other guesses? Uh, it is World War II. So this is um, uh, this is a bunch of Allied forces uh, within World War II uh, working on code breaking uh, regarding the Enigma. So, oh, okay, all right, all right, my bad. I, all right, never mind. Gentleman back there was also correct. So, um, <laughs> tell my hearing is so good after all that metal music. Um, all right. So, this is this is I think a perfect example of strategic deception at play because the Allies broke uh, the Allied forces broke the Enigma, and that allowed them to basically eavesdrop on Nazi messages as they were being sent back and forth. However, they could not actively act on the intelligence they that they were getting from those broken messages. And there's a great uh, book about this um, called Bodyguard of Lies. Uh, it's, you can find it on Amazon. It's a two volume part. Uh, I have a references thing at the end that you can, uh, uh, that has a whole bunch of books and papers and stuff that you can uh, dig through if you're interested. But they could not take action on this critical insight that they were getting. So they had to basically sit on their hands and, and watch things happen in some cases. And they had to be very selective and intentional about the actions that they did take uh, relative to the intelligence that they were getting. And because if they, if they did act on that intelligence, 
Nazis would likely have found out that the, the enigma was broken. They would have changed things up, and then they would have been back at square one. The adversary would have quickly adapted, and the, and the, and the allies basically kept them in a state of suspension by not actively acting on the intelligence that they were getting. So with that in mind, uh, three main things. So deception needs to be intentionally designed, placed, and invested in, managed through the lens of broader strategic objectives. So you have to know what in the world you're trying to accomplish, why you're trying to accomplish, and you have to uh, make sure that that is in alignment with other security controls that you're focused on within your environment. Um, you know, deception is not the only thing that you should be doing as a, you know, within a security program or else you are probably going to find yourself on the front page of the Wall Street Journal in some, at, and you know, someday it's not going to be good because there's a lot of other things as a part of resiliency that you should be investing in. Next thing, uh, ask yourself the question, are you using deception to aid control, prevention, detection, or response? Or a combination of all of those things. It doesn't have to be one or one of the others. And then deception is not just a tool or appliance, just like application security is not a tool or appliance, just like uh, embracing a DevOps like culture change is not, you don't, you don't go out and purchase three, uh, three items of DevOps and then drop it into your environment and voila, you're off to the races. No, it's a, it's a capability. It's a culture change, just like deception is, um, I believe. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk through two schools of thought really quick. And then I have the, the more technical, uh, little toolbox, if you will. Uh, so the first one, Maskirovka, uh, is a Russian is the Russian school of thought around deception, and it's built on five main principles. Um, and this you could you could go online and and read about and study this, but this is the kind of stuff that you'll see them uh, actively do in, uh, for example, the recent Ukraine conflict. Um, they are concealing their actions. Uh, they go in, they take action against their adversaries, and then they they get on they get on public TV, deny like crazy, nothing is happening here. While in the background, they're just needling away until they get what they want. And so these five principles that it's built on: concealment, imitation, simulation, disinformation, and demonstrative measures. Um, basically, what I tried to do here is is have a cybersecurity like corollary uh, to each of the. Uh, each of the principles that uh, that these were built on, and I'm not gonna, I'm not just gonna read through those things. Um, so the reason that I chose the Russians um, in this, give me one second, is they have they have a very unique um, blend of of thinking in terms of military and political uh, strategy. So they're obviously right next door to China. Uh, China has a a methodology or school of thought all to its own, and that is uh, actually on the next slide. But Russia has a very, uh, almost like a hybrid approach of Western-based thinking, which is very in-your-face, smack dab, get it done, uh, surprise-oriented, and Eastern-based techniques, which is a little bit more focused on indirection and, uh, and concealment. And they blend it together very, very nicely over history. And there's a ton of amazing, uh, you know, biographies and uh, military studies and stuff like that that you can read through if you want to learn more about that. The second one, uh, so 24 characters. This is actually Deng's 24 characters, which was a national strategy, uh, national security strategy document that came out a couple decades ago, and the 36 stratagems. Uh, so I pulled out a few elements of, uh, of both of these two doctrines, if you will, uh, deception doctrines from uh, that are kind of held up as pillars of Chinese deception uh, thinking. And as you can see, it's, it's very, very different. So the Russian, uh, the Russian form is very, uh, it's very much focused on offensive, um, offensive measures. So they are going to conceal their actions. They're going after and actively intimidating somebody. Um, they're, they're applying misdirection in the form of simulation and disinformation. Um, and then, and then they're taking other measures. The, the Chinese, uh, Eastern school of thought is much more drawn out. It's a little bit more low and slow. So as you can see, we have things on here like maintaining a low profile, 
uh, really being intentional about uh, utilizing power positioning or uh, position in general relative to your adversary and um, uh, you know, acting very calmly through situations so as not to uh, stir up excitement about a particular, um, you know, as though you've like stumbled onto something important, for example. Um, uh, let's say if, uh, if you were to take some political action uh, against a Chinese resource uh, and they are following this, this sort of school of thinking, they may not get very excitable and, and all of that because they don't want to lead on that you are onto something that is very, very important to them as an example. So uh, on to the, the more technical measures. Um, and I have a lot more uh, ideas on here that we can uh, talk about offline or we can tweet back and forth or email. Um, but it's running out of slide space and I didn't want to bore everyone with a bunch of bullets. Um, so we have very commonly applied deception techniques on the left here. So sandboxes, honey pots, or honey things, um, connection delays, um, returning false information, stuff like that. And the things that are not so common that I think are a little bit more interesting to, uh, to consider is applying the honey concept to things like uh, people, uh, to customers, to, um, uh, to files, to databases, to entire systems that are very much uh, they look like they're a part of the of the environment or you know you name things a certain way that they uh, you know sensitive things appear unsensitive non-sensitive things appear sensitive that sort of stuff um, we can we can keep our deception uh, controls that we are layering throughout our environment moving you know we don't have to place a honeypot in one place and that's the only place it stays until the end of time as adversaries are actively learning and figuring it out. We can use some of the same moving target DevOps like easy deployment uh, methodologies that we're using to, to bolster and advance AppSec to advance these sorts of capabilities. Um, we can also start to layer honeypots. If we do want to go with the honeypot approach because there's a lot of active tech and stuff out there, um, you can layer them in a sense that uh, let's say you have five honeypots that are uh, that are on your perimeter or in the DMZ or whatever. They're they're um, working their way from the outside in. You may want to take um, thank you so much. You may want to take active action on some of the ones that are uh, that are very very obvious, only to let your uh, only to lure your adversaries into thinking that there are others or that they have found all of them, and that they once they've identified those, they can proceed a little bit more freely. Um, as an example. So we went through the kill chain and the OODA loop a little bit earlier. Another way I want to uh, present to you guys uh, as, a, as a possible way to think about this is layering deception controls outside from the inside out from where your assets actually lie. And obviously, you're going to have more than one asset in your organization. Um, but it could get really complicated to represent that in, in a more uh, complete way. So layering deception controls from the inside out. So if you think about, uh, let's say you have um, healthcare records in a database somewhere in AWS, there's a set of servers that can communicate with that. There's a set of servers that can communicate with those servers. And then there's maybe like an SSO uh, infrastructure. There's some users, there's a VPN, stuff like that. You could, you could work your way in a concentric fashion out from the inside out. And then you could you know, kind of plot this out. If you wanted to, maybe you want to have um, certain forms of deception on the outside and other forms closer towards your assets that are, uh, you know, maybe you want to start um, blocking closer to, the, uh, closer to the assets. Or maybe you don't because you want to, uh, maybe you want to just rely more heavily on exfiltration controls and use the deception to aid in attribution, for example. Like that is something that you could consider um, in, your, in your broader strategy. So it's completely contextualized. So I'm going to wrap up. I've got two slides that are very much uh, more thought-provoking questions. And I'll just rifle through those uh, really quickly. So this is pertinent, obviously, to, the, uh, to your strategy that you're developing in the HyperCon is um, what options are available to us if we know that our deception has been discovered? You know, we may want to just invest or kind of continue on as we were and rely on other security controls to, uh, to do 
do what they are intended to do. We may want to take that down. We may want to leave it up and then deploy other deception controls around it um, to to increase the, the sphere of resiliency that we have in place. And I think the answer to this is just outright no. Blocking or stopping is not always in line with the bigger picture that you may uh, be striving towards. And But it's worth stopping and asking yourself the question because your tools that you're getting on the market will push you down that rabbit hole. Um, and you know, just keep that in mind with regards to the kinds of adversaries that you're, uh, that you're working with. And um, you know, if you are working in an organization that is operating on more of a, uh, a national level, critical infrastructure level, where you're interfacing with DHS, things like that, uh, so fi big financial services, healthcare, other things that have been labeled critical infrastructure, then attribution efforts is something that's really, really important to the DHS if you're you know, sharing intel, that kind of thing. Um, so it's another angle to consider in this broader strategy. And then next one is if you are mapping out the kinds of adversaries that your organization is going to be actively uh, sparring with over time, um, I think it's worth considering how culture affects deception techniques or just the way that people think about deception. And so that's where we can think back to the Russian and China, the, the delta between the Russian and Chinese school of thought, which is way different than the American and uh, very, very Western school of thought. And you know, you could think about this through a very simple uh, example of like the death by a thousand cuts uh, way of targeting somebody versus the surprise camouflage attack to take somebody down. Um, both methods of attack, both methods of sparking conflict can be very, very damaging and can get the job done. But it's worth asking yourself, which is more damaging over time? It depends. And uh, then, of course, you'd, you should just always ask yourself, like, if you're considering or sparring with an adversary, is deception even at play? Um, because they are, of course, afforded all the same options to be just as creative and slippery as we are. So, with wrapping up, uh, three things to keep in mind if you are uh, interested in getting started with a deception capability at your organization. And I can uh, talk offline with people because I don't want it recorded about what we are doing um, with deception uh, capabilities at SourceClear uh, that you may find interesting. Yeah, just come up and see me afterwards. But first things first is to lay out and define strategic objectives that matter to your particular threat model, your particular organization. Um, you know, depending on the assets that you're protecting, the type of uh, industry that you work in, this is going to differ uh, from environment to environment. And that's why that cookie cutter approach does not work. Um, not that they can't help, but they are not going to solve your problem, just like there is not an AppSec tool in AppSec appliance. Um, next thing is to quantify and learn about the types of adversaries that you are that matter to you, that matter to your business. So you don't have to be tracking down APT groups as they're uh, you know, pushed out by FireEye or Silence or you know, whatever uh, threat intel group you, uh, you kind of subscribe to. This is more, you can, you can bucket them into archetypes. Um, you, know, you, may be, uh, you may be worried about advanced persistent threats uh, to throw a buzzword at you or advanced targeted threats from a particular part of the world. And you can ascertain this from you know, looking at your logs and seeing what countries are hitting you the most frequently. Um, and you can kind of just create a general archetype of the kind of adversaries that you're worried about and that matter to your organization and work backwards from there and, and design deception controls that kind of align with those particular adversaries or classes thereof. And remember that in the beginning, doing less is more. And this is just general principle uh, for life. Try to do just one thing at a time. Don't drop a thousand things in and think that like just peppering your environment with a million uh, bits of deception is going to be effective because I, I really think that just like, uh, you know, if you're developing and rolling out a static analysis capability, dropping it in and running away and expecting it to work, it's you're probably going to really, really struggle. You need to place it intentionally. You need to invest in it. You need to have process behind it. You need to have standard operating procedures. You need to have people who know about it, can manage it, can nurture it, can change it, can enhance it, can upgrade it over time, things like that. So invest in one thing at a time. Less is more out of the gates. Um, 
because if it's obvious and you drift back in, if you drift from the con to the hypercon, then you're dead in the water. And these are some of the uh, resources that I had mentioned earlier. Again, these slides will be available. So um, the first one I think is really, really fascinating. And the first two actually capture the Chinese school of thought uh, very succinctly. I know the title, if you're, if you're worried about ending up on some blacklist somewhere, don't buy the first one. Uh, uh, but they, they, talk about <laughs> uh, they talk about basically stirring up conflict through all of these different angles. Um, coming at a, an adversary from an economic supply chain, um, military, societal influence perspective, like coming at them from all these angles and just trying to stir things up and create churn. And, and then they go in for the kill after all of that and it, amidst all of this chaos. It's, it's fascinating. And then you've got some of your other, um, you know, your, your typical, uh, typical things. I mentioned Bodyguard of Lies earlier. You've got The Prince, good old Machiavelli, uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War. Black Box Thinking is a fantastic read all geared around failure and the culture of learning around failure. Um, Most Secret War is, uh, is by R.V. Jones, or is a biography of, uh, of him. And that is, uh, he was this military scientist uh, for uh, the UK, for London's uh, military during World War II. And he was just always coming up with crazy off the wall ideas. Um, Stratagem is more of a uh, general military deception uh, book written about American, uh, American strategies. And then there's a ton of good, solid published guides online about Chinese, US, um, all sorts of countries just putting this stuff out there as they become declassified and such. Um, and the keywords I think to look for, obviously deception, information operations, psychological operations, gray zone warfare, and red teaming. And with that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone here and to the organizers, and uh, I will take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. A very nice talk. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, thank you. I was wondering if you might have a few words of advice for those of us who really like what you say but have to convince our management or C-level executives that a, this is legal, and B, this is not going to look, quote unquote, bad if it comes out because you list things like deception, cyber ops, gray warfare. Yeah, yeah. I know better. Those are fine. But the <laughs> rank and file and, the, frankly, your chief executive officer, chief financial officer, or your OGC lawyer might not agree with me. So right. do you have any suggestions on how we might navigate that minefield? Yeah, well, I think that's where starting off, um, starting off small is really, really important. And you wouldn't want to necessarily... Uh, I don't think anyways, start off like by creating fake people at an organ. So organization that I worked at in the past, we had uh, like 10 fake employees and uh, we would like stir things up on social media for them. And, uh, and basically wh how we, how we use those people is anytime they received any kind of email is either sales um, or it was phishing. And if it was fish, well, every, anything that they got, we would just take and put into an email filter and then do something else with them across the org, like see who else was emailing them, that kind of stuff. But I don't think you necessarily want to jump straight into the deep end with things like that, but start really, really small. Um, and, you know, don't uh, it, like make sure that you are correlating any, any control that you're proposing with the value that you're going to get. So, you know, maybe the, maybe the corollary value is uh, aiding security monitoring and response. Maybe it is, um, you know, making, uh, making this particular application a little bit like it's, it's a hardening exercise, things like that. And, you know, talk about the potential reduction in risk and, you know, frame it through the business lens and don't focus so much on the fact that it's, you know, big, scary deception focus that it, it is just another form of security control. And here's the value that we get from it. So, um, I found that to be like generally good advice for just about anything I want to do in an org. So yeah, good question. Hey, great talk. Thank um, you. So I've seen this in organizations, and it kind of depends on the size of the organization. But how do you make uh, whether it's you know honey items, you know honey tokens, whatever it is, attractive for an attacker? 
but deal with that signal to noise of what I would categorize as like friendly fire or you know your people tripping over it. So yeah, you know, oh, this looks you know super interesting. I'm going to click on it and then. You know, it's like Carol. This is the fake. You know, you clicked on it again. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, honestly, that's a, that is a very, very good question. I think um, so. I think signal to noise is just one of those inevitable evils, depending on where you place something. Like if you uh, let's say create a tripwire of a file, um, for example, um, you know that accessing that file, um, you know, it might be instead of advising them that it's a form of deception, uh, maybe you advise them that um, you know, accessing that kind of file might be outside of security policy or something like that and, and frame it in a different way because A, you don't want to like tip your hand and let that potentially get out there. Um, but B, that's why I also think it's a really, really important to start really small and be super intentional about where you put anything um, because like, you don't want to A, have a bunch of stuff that is potentially ineffective and be overwhelm your sock with a bunch of stuff that, that is not, you know, false positive, uh, friendly fire, so to speak. So, yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>